I was in Washington D.C. and I was beating it around, and there were no places that were. This is you have to remember there were. I didn't know there were young comics doing it up in New York City. Mm. I was running around. Uh, I'd run into one other guy. Mm-hmm. One other guy, Lewis Black, was also running around town. We were both scrapping. There was no. There were no gigs. Right. Uh, there was a place called the Child Harold on Dupont Circle, uh, mm. and it was played live music. I mean, they famously had Springsteen, the East Street Band. It was a small place. Literally had a picture of like Bruce Springsteen and, and the drummer up on the stage and everybody else is in the audience. <laughs> the <rest laughs> of the audience. And a check for $250 up behind a bar. So they had all, they always had live music there. Hmm. So my friend was a bartender. He must've told the owner that I was a stand-up comic. So the guy comes over to me, Bill Hurd, famous guy, big brawling ex bouncer drinker. And he goes, Hey, I heard you're doing comedy. And uh, you want to open up for this band next week? I'll give you 50 bucks. You know? And I was like, I didn't know you could get paid doing it. I was like, <laughs> Bucks, man. I'm running around doing pizza joints and singer songwriter nights and coffee shows. And, you know, I'm just like, kidding. I said, Yeah, man. I, 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 yeah, absolutely. I didn't care. I didn't ask. It was a good deal for him. Looking back, the, the band had a record contract, then he, he had to get a had to get opening act. It was his responsibility. So if you hired a local band, he's going to pay a couple hundred bucks. He's going to pay me 50. He's making money. So right. I show up the next week and on the marquee out front, it says, From New York City, the Ramones. This is Tokyo Tonight. If you've been following the Gabby Petito case, we were talking about that. It's a little strange all the way around. They lured up so fast, they wouldn't talk to anybody. He gets a three day head start. It's all very suspicious that they, oh, there, you know, they found the spot after all this time. And there's yeah. his notebook. And look, his baby shoes are there. And his <laughs> graduation cap. But well, certainly must be our son. <laughs> <laughs> oh god it's his foreskin from circumcision they're like how did this get here this is weird <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly there's there's a photo with him in a in a newspaper holding it up five, seven days ago <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i love it yeah it must so- be your son <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> hey, let's hurry up we gotta get the early bird special honey yeah, <laughs> and it, and it's also weird too. Like, there's photos of them walking around with the uh, FBI investigators and the police officers. Like, like they're out for a fucking hike. Like, they're just they're cat. They're smiling. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was weird. Mean, meanwhile, down in Cancun. <laughs> 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 Oh my god. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's telling everybody like these are my choking hands. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, I gotta tell you, I, I we've never met in person, but I'm a huge fan of yours and I loved the documentary that you did um years ago. I thought it was to to for I don't even know if this means anything to you, but I remember when I was younger I saw a comedian, you know, the Jerry Seinfeld one. I like I thought yours was ten times better at yeah. explaining the, the stand up element to it and making it kind of fun and you know, uh enjoyable. That, that's what we were hoping to do. I mean, that, I can't, came on board. That was the original, just to go interview comics about every aspect of it, heckling and yeah. everything that, about it, joke thievery and interview comics. And then we were at the um, uh, Upright Citizens Brigade one night up on Franklin in, in L.A. And, um, and I guess Jordan, the director, saw that look of fa- my face. I was watching other comics. He saw that look of lust for laughter. Hey, you want to try it again? <laughs> like, well, oh yeah, okay, I guess so. And that that became a thing. It was always one of my favorite things when a like when a veteran comic would kind of break it down in that way. I had when I was a kid, I was a huge comedy nerd, and I had um, Franklin Ajay's book, uh, Comic Insights, and I just oh. loved that kind of. It was it's like the best guide that I had when I was younger. I took that everywhere with me. I I, I love Franklin on a personal level. When I first started. Uh, Andy Evans and I switched off at Garvin's in Washington, D.C., was bringing in professional comedians. This is the first one on the East Coast bringing in you know, what we call modern comedy club, right? Bringing in professional comics and paying them. And I was mm-hmm. a local and I was MCing. So Andy and I showed up 
at Franklin and Jive was opening up for Donny Hathaway at the cellar doors, like a 200 seat club in, in, wow. in Georgetown. Oh. And the, and the between shows were like, you know, can, can we meet? Can I say some hello or something? You know, I just been doing comedy like a year or so. Mm-hmm. And you're just thinking the guy's going to go, I got, I don't have time or he's okay. Here. Hello. Good, good luck to you. God bless you. Get out of here. You know? mm-hmm. And uh, no, he brought us in and come, come up to the room. We hung out with him. And then afterwards he shared his marijuana with us. And that was, that was one of my first days. Oh, he's getting a better breed of marijuana than I'm getting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, celebrity marijuana. <laughs> I like it. I like it very much. That's he fantastic. Was, he was so nice. And so like, you know, just telling us things and, and, you know, just that thing of like that you could only, Tell, I mean, I had it. I knew it instinctively. He says, you can only get better going on stage. Go on stage every night, everywhere, everywhere, all mm-hmm. the time, multiple, as many times as you can. Get on stage, no matter what. You know, yeah. It's just yeah. that. I, I like that. And one of the other things, too, is like what I got out of your documentary, too, is uh, almost like a real live feel of the camaraderie that used to exist back when you guys started. Because those, those are all your friends. You know all those guys for years. But it seemed like you didn't lose any time in between, even though you may have not <laughs> seen them in a while. No, no, no. I mean, just one of my favorite moments is uh, Bobby Slayton, who I, you know, I used to party with all the time. I mean, he had this like, he had all this movie memorabilia in his house. He had this huge life size, the creature from the Black Lagoon, like a life size. I mean, and if you're like gacked out of your mind and you get cornered to go to the bathroom at four in the morning and you see that, thing, you, know, so, you know, so he, so he, we're sitting there and on camera, he goes, and seriously, dead seriously, he just goes, well, you know, I didn't do cocaine and party like you guys. And you just hear me breaking up laughing, right? <laughs> and he goes, no, no. He, he's like, he got caught in a lie. Oh, like that's great. To, like he's trying to press people. Like, you know, I, I, I came out of straight, straight and honest. <laughs> <laughs> we had him on the show. He was one of our uh, first guests. And I, I mean, he just, from the minute he came on, just relentlessly shit on me. It was beautiful. It was the, I loved every minute of it. Because I referred to him as a legend. Yeah, man. I, you know, he, I he's one of the I was, I was saying, I, I referred to him as a legend. And he was like, you know, you fucking suckered me onto here by calling me a legend. I fell for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like, I mean it. <laughs> <laughs> that is, look, man, I know you're sincere. But you know, I've been just well, and everybody, call, anybody who's old, they don't know what to say about him. Go, he's a legend. You know, what I'm <laughs> it's amazing, guy's still working. <laughs> right, that that's what it comes down to. And right, and, and I, you really don't need to introduce a legend, honestly. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> good. but it's like when they go icon, you know, he's an icon. I go icon. I don't look at that guy's face and think stand up comedy. You don't call that guy an icon. But that's it. Oh my God, that's great! Who were the guys when you were when you were coming up? Who did you emulate? Like, who were the people that you admired that got you into it? Well, I, I mean, uh, the, the, the obvious ones for me. I mean, I love Robert Klein. I saw him in '73. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he made me so laugh so hard I fell out of the stands. I hadn't even thought about doing stand up yet. Right. I saw Carlin '74, Martin Mull around the same time. I saw oh, a lot Martin of them. Mull. Obviously, those are the people. Um, that I just, I loved Albert Brooks. I would, I would like scan the old TV guide or newspaper. And I, I was in school and I just, he, for whatever reason, he just hooked me. Albert yeah. Brooks is, I mean, just one of the funniest guys ever. And his standup was so conceptual, so wild uh, doing mm-hmm. it. I mean, and that's like the, the thing you expect. I mean, I, I remember seeing um, Steve Martin uh, on Tonight Show and thought how different he was. All these people are different. I mean, they came up, uh, every generation does it differently. And I have much respect for Mort Soul just passed, much respect. Yeah. But they go, um, you know, Dave Chappelle and Hannah Gatsby would not be possible without Dave Chappelle. I go, I mean, without Dave Chappelle and Hannah Gatsby would not be possible without Mort Saul. And I'm going like, well, Mort Saul would not be possible without Mrs. Saul. I mean, there's this really, <laughs> you can't. It's Mort Saul broke through new ground, right? He broke through new ground in this time. He did, but you can't do it any other way at that time. He was not going to try to do what Milton Berle was going to do any more right. than the Rolling Stones were going to try to do what the Everly Brothers did. It's just not going to happen. You've got to do every generation has to do it differently. Have to do it their way. I mean, you're not going to look at your parents going, "I want to do it just like dude. I want to go out and dance like them." I want to, you know, just <laughs> those guys. Bam! At 25, no, oh, I too much like my parents. Bam! You know. Right? <laughs> You got to break clean. You got to, you know, and so every generation has does it as in comedy, music, whatever they acting, whatever they do it differently. Yeah. And, and so Mort Saul had to do it differently. Had no choice. He he was in L.A. He he bombed out. He couldn't go into those nightclubs with the tuxedo on 
and do that stupid patter the way they were doing it. You know, just sure. that my mother-in-law jokes or my wife can't drive, or whatever. It right. couldn't do it. Do you think, do you think I always, I always wonder because every comic kind of has a different answer to this, but it's like, do you think Robert Klein was the first of that generation to start doing the observational personal material almost? Because it was, yeah, yeah he was, he, he was definitely early on. I mean, I know Carlin made the shift. I mean, he made the shift to be doing observation material in the mm -hmm. 70s, but Klein might have been ahead of him on that. I mean, Klein was, you know, he was smart. He, he didn't, it was like, again, that that's what Mort Saul was doing too. You know, Mort Saul didn't talk down to do at all. He right. assumed they read at the right, he assumed they read the paper, he assumed they read books. That all those people back then did. Newhart yeah. did. He assumed you knew about the Wright brothers, everything. He assumed you knew about the Gettysburg Address. He just, you know, you you expected your audience to be up to date on it. And Klein was definitely, I mean, he I just remember him being smart. He had that attitude and he and he he really you could I just seemed like push him for the laugh. Push. I mean, he was making the effort. I mean, he was, you know, he was close to those kind of um those those old right like a throwback, like you know, back to the vaudeville. They called them sweat acts. They come out like, you know, just gonna no way you're not gonna laugh. I'm gonna do whatever it takes. But he had a he had a dignity to him and a and a and a sarcastic attitude, you know. And there was one commercial back then. It was like, my wife, you know, the guy, the guy in the commercial, he would go, my wife, like yeah. he'd be condescending. I love with my wife and my wife. <laughs> and Clyde just mocked him. So like, my wife, I think I'll keep her. <laughs> His attitude was so strong. Yeah. Yeah. He had a lot of confidence. And, and uh, I, I remember um, one of my, I mean, you know, uh, I think it was my uncle or somebody had seen him do the teacher thing because he's a teacher on on uh, Carson no or whatever. No talking. Yeah, and it was great. It was the first time I'd seen anybody like kind of like talk about that kind of shit too. So it was kind of interesting to me. Um, do you remember your first like paid gig? Like, how was you, how did you get into the stand up world? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> always, always. You remember all those things. You remember your first laugh. You remember your first. So I was I was in Washington D.C. and I was beating it around, and there were no places that were. This is you have to remember there were. I didn't know there were young comics doing it up in New York City. Mm. I was running around. Uh, I'd run into one other guy. Mm -hmm. One other guy, Lewis Black, was also running around town. We were both scrapping. There was no. There were no gigs. Right. Uh, there was a place called the Child Harold on DuPont Circle, uh, mm. and it was played live music. I mean, they famously had Springsteen, the East Street Band. It was a small place. Literally had a picture of like Bruce Springsteen and and the drummer up on the stage, and everybody else was in the audience. <laughs> the <rest laughs> of the audience. And it checked for two hundred fifty dollars up behind a bar. So they had all. They always had live music there. Mm. So my friend was a bartender. He must have told the owner that I was a stand-up comic. So the guy comes over to me, Bill Hurd, famous guy, big brawling ex-bouncer drinker. And he goes, hey, I heard you're doing comedy. And uh, you want to open up for this band next week? I'll give you 50 bucks. You know, and I was like, I didn't know you could get paid doing it. I was like, 50 <laughs> bucks, man. I'm running around doing pizza joints and singer-songwriter nights. And, <laughs> shows and, you know, I'm just like, getting... I said, yeah, man. I, 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 yeah, absolutely. I didn't care. I didn't ask. It was a good deal for him looking back. The, the band had a record contract then he, he had to get a had to get opening act it was his responsibility so if you hire a local band he's gonna pay a couple hundred bucks he's gonna pay me 50 he's making money so right. I show up the next week and on the marquee out front it says from New York City the Ramones wow <laughs> I I didn't know anything about the Ramones I walk into place I, I I was still in my you know early 70s Jackson Brown long hair painter bib overall <laughs> period. <laughs> and I right. there, every angry young man in the DC metropolitan areas. <laughs> you know, I'd never seen shaved heads and mohawks and safety pins through the cheek and all. <laughs> I, I go back to oh the my park, God. and Bill Hurd's like, they're going to kill you, man. He's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, You're not going to make 15 minutes in front of that band. You know, I said, look, oh. I said, uh, I'm going to do it. To me, it was like, I'm from Jersey, man. It's a rodeo gig. I'm on till the buzzer goes. <laughs> I'm telling you right now. <laughs> because you won't make five minutes, I'll bet you double or nothing. I said, I'll take it. And wow. I probably had a couple of shots in me, too. And so uh, they introduced me. It's a small room. It's like, you know, there's no backstage. I'm back in a the bar. They introduced, I don't know what they said for the introduction. Mm -hmm. Probably what the audience heard was, ladies and gentlemen, not the Ramones. <laughs> 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 I got to walk through the audience. I have to walk through straight through the crowd to go to the stage, right? And they're mm. booing me. You suck. You suck. Oh. You boo. I mean, they were right. I did suck, but they didn't know yet. They had no proof yet. <laughs> they, you know, they had. So they, I get up there and I mean, you know, 
I uh, I just had an act that went from A to B to C. I had no mm -hmm. improv skills. I had no certainly didn't have any Ramones material in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just do my little act. Anyway, I'm from New Jersey, and they're booing and you know screaming at me, and it's just a it's like a Phil Spector wall of booze coming at me. And <laughs> I I. Uh, my friend said, it's just like, you know, it's unbelievable. And, and, and so one of the guys just had enough of me and he tossed I mean, quickly. This is, this, this is all fast. It's like, I don't uh -huh. know how much he throws his mug of beer at me. You know, he just shoots his mug of beer at me, not the whole mug of glass and all, but he just shoots right. his beer at me, hits me in the face. I just, I kind of like shake it off like a dog, you know, and right back to my act. <laughs> anyway, my mom said, like, <laughs> I have no ability to do anything else. You know, I couldn't. And oh, so the, ne the guy, I guess the guy next to him said, well, if he took that beer, let's see if he takes this beer. And he hits me with the beer. And pretty soon they're all they're hitting me with a the beer. They got real organized like a deli. They were taking turns. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, audience, the audience is like, they're either screaming, laughing at me, getting hit with a beer. Or as soon as they start talking, they boo again. It's just a boo. Yeah, boo. <laughs> yay, hey, boo. Yay. And, and spears coming at me. And so. I'm right on the step. I mean, there's the, the amps are right next to me. It's a small, tiny stage, you know. And the mm -hmm. truck gets right behind me. So Bill Hurt, he he realized immediately this is not good. So he's just waving the money back there. Come on, come get your money, asshole. Come on. <laughs> like, it's a small room. I can see him. I just I I'm off this. I'm sure I didn't say thank you. Good night. God bless you. I just got <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and I go right into the right into the, the. There's no dressing room. There was just a you know kitchen behind the bar. So I go mm -hmm. into the kitchen. I am soaked from head to toe with beer. I'm toweling off. And Ramones are standing ready to go. I mean, I've never seen him before. Long hair, you know, they got the guitars ready. To, and one of Ramones looks at me and goes, cool act, man. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, there's there's an addendum to this, I got to tell you. So cut, cut to like 2005, Mark Schiff and I come out with this book called I Killed, which are all road stories, right? Love it, have it, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to go to go back and do promo in D.C. That's where I started. I want to promote this book down there. So Washington Post says, yeah, we'll, we'll promote it. And then they call me back. And the and the critic there says, look, I can't do it because the music guy saw the book. And I told him about the story. He said, there was no opening at the Ramones that night. I was there. The fall, whatever it was, fall of 80, 78. Right. He said, I was there. There was no opening. I said, look, I'm telling you, I was there. He said, I'm sorry, man. I can't do anything about it. The guy put the kibosh on it. I said, okay. Then a couple months later, they call me back. And the, the music critic has to apologize. He says, Look, I thought there was no opening act. And then just a couple of nights ago, I was talking to my wife about this. And she says, yeah, yeah no, do you remember there was a disturbance at the front of the stage? <laughs> I said, that's me. A disturbance. Oh, my God. Oh, God. What a great title for a book, too, or an album, The Disturbance at the I, Front of the Stage. And if I ever do a special, if I ever did, it'd be Disturbance at the Front of the Stage. <laughs> <laughs> that's just a great way to describe comedy in general that's all of us all the time <laughs> it's disturbance at the front of the stage oh fuck what a great first gig that is awesome yeah yeah that's incredible you know what i admit? I, I wish we did you know i feel like my generation kind of missed the whole opening for bands thing i know like like i've heard like a million horror stories and stuff but we that that died at some point i don't know why i, I did so many of them i mean that's all the work that i did when i started was it was it New York? That, was it because you guys had similar agents and they just hooked you up together and sent you out? In, I got hooked into the cellar door. I did a lot of opening act for him and did a lot of good work. Also, oh, cool. Robert Hunter from the Grateful Dead. They reached. Oh, I did Rick Danko right. from the band. I, I did. So I, I was doing well, and you know they had a cellar door, which is a couple hundred seat room. Then the then right. um, they had the um, uh, the five hundred seat room. I can't think of the name of that. Doesn't matter. But anyway, they had different rooms, right? And I played them all. I went up to like all the way up to like Meriwether Post Pavilion. You know, it was like eleven thousand people for Chicago. I mean, right. I, they, they put me on. They had con like Rich Hall. You know, the comedian Rich Hall. Yeah, yeah, of course. Rich yeah. Hall. He also did a lot of opening act work down in D.C. And I started getting uh, a pretty good rep around there. And I got reviews, and it, it was good. It was great work. I learned how to do it. I mean, there was. I opened up for uh, uh, Wendy o. Williams and the Plasmatics. You remember that group? Yes. Wow. Back there, yeah. a young comic. I can't remember his name now. He said he was 18 year old in the audience. And I come out and then by <laughs> then, man, I knew it was just, you know, it was a whip in a chair, man. I was not even trying sure. to, it was like, just, uh, you know, it, it was just, you know, kick me in the balls. I kick you in the balls verbally, you know, just going back and forth. Mm. And so he said, you got up there and they started coming out. You said, listen, you fuckers, <laughs> <laughs> listen, you fuckers. I'm out here for 15 minutes and the band ain't coming out for 15 minutes. No matter how you cut, if you kill me now, you just, <laughs> that'll be it. Right. And so a lot of times 
I do that, and the audience go, ha, they laugh, and they get control, and I could slide in the act and start rolling, right? Mm-hmm. But this time, they all laughed, and then one guy yelled, let's kill him now! clear. <laughs> 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 so I had to laugh. I had to laugh. It was just like that. What was it like? I mean, did you, how did you balance the having to perform in that kind of way for the bands and stuff like that versus, you know, getting into a club and stage? Was it equal amount of time? I, like, I, 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 there was a place to open around 78. Uh, L. Brookman's was a little bar down, down in the Anacostia in DC. And all these comedians went in there. We all went in there and started working out. That was on mm-hmm. the weekend, but I went anywhere I could. So I didn't have any experience of like, I didn't even know the comedy clubs existed until. After wow. I'd opened up for Ramones and my friend said, you know, there are comics like you up in New York City. She took me up there. I saw the comic strip, the improv, Catch a Rising Star. I went, oh, my God. You know, wow. there's all these great young comics. I saw Seinfeld. I saw all these great. I said, oh, my God. Yeah. I didn't know that world existed. And then I was like, now I got to know that there's, you know, so I didn't know. I didn't have anything to compare it with. It wasn't like I was going into comedy clubs. and going, boy, I wish I was here. So and, Seinfeld and those guys, Larry Miller, Paul Reiser, they were in the class ahead of you. Yeah, they were. But they were when I got to New York City. They were they were established guys. I mean, wow. They, okay. Um, you know, I, when I moved up there, I remember I had a couple of bits. Like um, Larry Miller had a bit about um, his parents going away for out of town, and he had a yes. big car at his house, parents' house, and I had the same sort of bit. Well, mm-hmm. I just dropped it before I got there. I just dropped mine. I didn't want anybody thinking at all that I, I'd come to town. He was copying anybody's material. I mean, just I just came in like. Okay, you know, let's, let, you, but they were there. They were there, and it was ongoing. And it, wow. it was great. Bill Maher, Gilbert Godfrey, Rick Overton, Glenn Hirsch. Do you remember who Gilbert. passed you at the New York clubs? Uh, yeah, well, when I, I was working at Garvin's, so I met all these comics, right? And they were like, you got to move mm. up, you got to move up. And so within two months, I said, okay, I'm moving, I'm going. And uh, uh, Glenn Hirsch and um, uh, Rick Overton took me over to Improv. And uh, nice. they quickly passed me a pass, but that just gives you the right to hang out, do the hang, you know, just sit in the bar night after night, like a vulture waiting for somebody mm-hmm. not to show up. Otherwise you're on like a two in the morning, three in the morning. And um, one guy, one, one night on a Friday, Gilbert, nobody wanted to follow Gilbert back then. Gilbert was a destroyer in 20 yeah. minutes. Just a, and he, he, he was so different that if you went on stage doing regular jokes after him, you, you, he just, he's just unbelievable. And so, um, Guy didn't show up. Richie Gold didn't show up on a Friday night. And I saw uh, Howard Klein, who was a big time manager out in LA now, and Chris Albrecht, who was running HBO eventually. HBO, yeah. Loved it. I saw him looking out in the bar. I, You know, you just know by then. I, I just sit down there, sip my Coke, watching him. And I saw him looking out, like looking for some regular comic. And I didn't see anybody. Just me sitting down at the end of the bar, you know, mm-hmm. that guy from DC. And they, I saw him on the phone calling up. I know what they're doing. They're calling up Catch a Rising Star, the comic strip. Who's there? Send somebody over. We need an act. And nobody was there. And finally, Howard comes over to me and says, uh, can you go hold the crowd? Basically, can you go up there and hold the crowd? You know? And uh, Wow. Yeah, and I did. And once I held the crowd, then I was starting to get the weekend spots. And that was like a whole different thing. Then I was like a paid comic. It's funny, these little levels, right? That next one, yeah. a paid comic. You know? It's interesting, too, because of how we, like, over the years, how they, how everybody kind of goes through that process to get them. Because now the MC doesn't pass anybody anymore. But the MC back in the day was like the the top guy, right? At Catch a Rising Star, for sure, Richard Belzer ruled that place. Yeah. After that, Kelly Rogers and Bill Maher and Adrian Tulsh. I mean, those people, they chose who was going on next. Wow. There was a set lineup at the Improv, but the MC on the, like I did the town, in the amateur times. And the comic strip, they also had a set lineup. But, you know, Catch yeah. it was really, the, the MC controlled everything. Did you, are you one of those guys who subscribe to the idea that one was cooler than the other? Like catch was where all the cool people hung out and comic strip, not so much, or. I just, I just wanted to get on stage. I didn't care, man. I, I'd go out to Jersey I hear and call around and try to get more stage time. I'd go over to the triple in, <laughs> the triple in. It was down. I don't yep. know what I poured authority. I don't even know where that, I couldn't even find it today. It was some yeah. bar dartboard right next to the microphone. So you really <laughs> hope they collected all the darts before you got up there. I mean, I was up there once in the dark, went, like, you know, it's like you're, you know, it was a bar. It was a down and out bar. Yeah. Over there. I didn't care. I, didn't, I did it. Was- I did a bar in this, in this shit town in New Jersey. Like obviously, by the way, name, name any town in New Jersey at this point, but like there was, it was a small, <laughs> it was a small town. doesn't really narrow it down. Um, but uh, so I get there to do the gig or whatever and there's nobody there. And it's getting close to like when the showtime starts, right? So this is like the first problem. So I'm like, you know, getting kind of like, is there really a show here? Like what's going on? There's a stage. And I asked the bartender and he's like, oh, don't worry. They'll be here. 
And I'm like, well, where, where's everybody now? And they go, well, they're just, they're at a wedding. And I went, the whole town? Is that a wedding? <laughs> and I shit you not, this small little town, they all showed up and like, you know, to get trash this bar. So I'm like, all right, whatever. And then I look at the stage and the stage is in front of the kitchen door. So as I'm <laughs> on stage, there's people walking up to go in and out of the thing. And I'm like, this is the weirdest fucking shit. But I was like, whatever. They're paying me. It's fine. But hilarious. <laughs> you, you just reminded me of something. Uh, you know, there was a first stand-up comic. I don't know if you know that. There was a first guy named no. Artemis Ward. And he did it during the Civil War. So, no way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything, every aspect the stand-up you could imagine he did and wow. went through so he did he did his wild west tour the civil war got so bad that it was hard to make audiences laugh by 63 64 you know three four years into yeah. the war the water was so much he couldn't make people laugh so he goes out west san francisco in that area and he does a lot of mining camps up in the in the in nevada sierra nevada before right mm -hmm. and one of so he'd go into the first one he goes into he goes in it's like it's it's like dusk and the guy guy goes uh, yeah we're gonna have a show here he goes he goes, um, well, well, how do you go to everybody? There's nobody here. How do you get him? He says, we'll, uh, we'll light a bonfire. They'll show up. <laughs> and guy light a bonfire. And all of a sudden, guys are coming out of caves and holes. And just, oh, bonfire must be a show tonight. <laughs> and they all come <laughs> out the show. So it never stops how to draw, oh. a drawing, a t getting a crowd together, how you do it. Yeah. It's it's the best, man. I love it. I, there's a, there's another book I read when I was younger too called Comic Lives. Do you remember that one that came yeah, out in like the seventies? Yes, I do. Betsy Bourne wrote that, and I yes, I think I'm briefly mentioned in it, as in maybe once. I don't know. I was gonna say no, you. <laughs> I think maybe <laughs> once or twice. Yeah, but yeah, you're mentioned in it, and they did. They said the same thing in that book, though, that you had just said about Gilbert. That he was just like this, like uh, the like a oh, comics comic oh, almost, but like blown blown away back in the day. He but you, he you had guys. A he would close with his character, Tony, a comic from Brooklyn. And this is before Dice Clay, right? Mm -hmm. So he put on this really, really sleazy, like, sport jacket, you know, like a poly right. sport jacket. And he'd break down jokes. He goes, he goes, hey, you hear about this one? You hear about the, why did the chicken cross the street? Who fucking cares? A fucking chicken. <laughs> don't give a shit what it thinks, right? <laughs> hey, why did the moron throw the clock out the window? Because he's a fucking moron. Are you fucking listening? It's fucking up. <laughs> The fucking moron. Break oh my god. And the place would be screaming. So if you were going up on stage and start doing regular jokes, they're like, oh man, we've seen them. <laughs> we got to constructed, man. You gotta come up. So you had to find a different thing to do. He did a bit where he'd take a bar stool and hold it up to his crotch so the four legs were sticking out. And he and and it was quadra dick. It was a monster <laughs> thing. And he did all the characters to the movie Jaws, right? As different <laughs> You know, like, like it was just unbelievable. Wow. And, 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 um, it, it just, it just, you know, he did Ralph Cramden as, as the, sh as the captain, you know, oh, mm. I'll catch your shark. I'll catch it. All right. <laughs> he, he, it just was, it, it was too intense. And he just kept flipping around. He did, he's so fast. He was so fast. What was your trajectory into TV like when you were doing it? Cause I know like you, you said you were opening for bands and stuff and then you were doing the New York scene or whatever. Was it your goal to get it on TV? Like everybody no. else's? No, I I had no plan. I had no plan. Oh, I just chased the laughter. I mean, honestly, mm. I lose my laughter. I just I'm going to New York City. I had no idea how I was going to make a living doing this. I didn't know how anybody did how they got in, and I worked a a a, a Jersey gig. Speaking of the Jersey gig, these fit they were fifty five dollars. Jerry Stanley had them there, fifty five dollar gigs. And I worked with Jerry Seinfeld. First time I ever worked with him. So wow. we get out. As he was established. That I mean, I you know I had not worked with him, but I'd seen him and I knew he was a top dog in town. We get out there. Mm -hmm. he, goes, uh, he goes, "I'll go first. I'm like, "What? You go first?" Because he because he'd see me. He goes, "Yeah, you got a lot of energy. I'll go first. And he goes up and he does sign talk. He does. Yeah. Sign. Now he's not scoring big. It's a Jersey bar crowd. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, yeah. He's not, but he won't break. He won't work blue. He won't deviate to what he's doing. He just stays with the plan. He's doing it right. Wow. So I get up on stage. I'm like, I know who these people are. I'll get down the mud with them. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll get, I'll set the mower low and cut the grass. I get dirty, blue, kill. We're driving back to town, and Jerry goes, um, "Listen, you're a funny guy. I never forget this. I never, you're a funny guy, but you're not going to get on TV when you work dirty like that. When you work blue, because your jokes will all be propped up with curse words, and when you take those curse words out for TV, it'll throw the timing of your joke off. And wow. I, need, I'm like going. Timing. I don't say it because I don't want to look like an idiot. Right, but, right. Well, it's timing. You know, I didn't. I, you know, 
as you learn and we learn, and I learned that night because he explained it to me. I mean, he went through, probably saw the look on my face and went, this guy doesn't know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, you got the audience to the place where when you give the punchline, you have to bring them there with a the setup at that exact moment. Yes. If too much setup, it's going to be a it's going to be a, a flat laugh. They figured it out before they got there. Not right. enough setup, and they're confused, and it's a delayed flat laugh, right? So you got to it's got to structure it so the timing, whether it's your 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 pause or how whatever you use the time words or whatever, the timing is key. Mm-hmm. And it was that sort of education. So I started working clean because I went, oh, you got to get on the Tonight Show. This is back. This is 1979. Right. Tonight Show was it. Johnny Carson was the gatekeeper. There were three yeah. networks. He was the only late night late night show. He made careers. And sure enough, you know, Seinfeld was that night at Jersey. He was looking ahead to Johnny. He's he's practicing this material for Carson, not for wow. these. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the thing that I was wondering about, too, is like Jerry said that he was going to go on first. Right. And yeah. this is kind of deviating from the Carson thing a little bit. So I want to get back to that, too. But at what point did like do you think there was a shift in control where like it seemed like for a long period of time comedians dominated the rooms they decided what was going to happen in them and then suddenly it shifted to where it was like the club owner the business owner you know what i mean like it seemed like you guys had a full fucking run (laughs) you know of the place (laughs) and then when i got there they were like you can have the cheese sticks (laughs) and i was like (laughs) my friend kevin rooney says they they give you all the coke and booze you wanted, but if you ask for a sandwich, you go half price. <laughs> we're not paying you before; we're paying you to talk a lot, get on stage, and be an idiot. Get a right. drink, do coke, get up there and be an idiot. So, <laughs> they, they, you're absolutely right, man. I saw it happen. You'd go out to these clubs, and the guys have been in the bar business, and obviously some of them were smart, and they saw it was coming. Mm-hmm. On like you know, Mark Ridley went out to Los Angeles, the comedy store, saw what yeah. was happening. on comedy, he was back. He starts the Comedy Castle, Detroit. Make Love you that place. I mean, he gets in the ground floor, starts early. He saw what was coming. Some of these guys, it was just the biggest fad, right? They, the, the disco ball was gone. The 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 bronking bucko, bronco, you know, they had those those things in bars for a while. The you know, yeah, the, the western thing that happened, in urban cowboy, was urban there. cowboy. I was just gonna right. say, yeah, yeah. So then they go, what's next? And so and so they see comedy. So you could enter the first time, and they're like, what? Are, what do you? How do you do it? What are you doing? What do you want to do? How long are you going to do? What do you, what do you going to, they, they don't know anything. They're learning. Wow. You, next time you come down, they're like, yeah, I got you down at 115. You're doing 100, hour 15. He's doing 25. I don't, I don't want to hear any more airplane. Jo- you know, it's like, <laughs> they, they, know yeah. they know everything. Wow. In two months, they all started getting in. And it's like they used agents at first, right? They used agents to book because they didn't know the comics. They didn't know in New York City who were the comics, who to get. Look, sure. you remember the, the showcase clubs. There yeah. were a lot of Comics that had 20 minute acts. That's all he had. They got lazy. Mm-hmm. If you get away with 20 minutes, the New York City was filled with tourists and, and make a fortune, right? Right. They weren't making any money, but they could get lazy just for that killer 20. Five of it's about subways, five of it's about, you know, the lousy right. department of cockroaches, all New York City stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But they get hired to go out to Pittsburgh. They don't want to hear subway jokes. They don't give a shit about your rat infested apartment in New York City. <laughs> And now you're down to 10 minutes of material. So you see those guys coughing. They're winded, man. It's 15 minutes. There. So, where are you from? Pittsburgh. Oh, Pittsburgh. What do you got, man? Better have some more jokes because we're all from Pittsburgh. We all work. At- <laughs> oh, my God. So then, so, okay. So you do that. You go so and then you. I, I built material. I was always in the material. I, I learned that watching Seinfeld and those guys. Right. They didn't just say, they were constantly digging new, new, new ground, man. They're constantly laying new crops. Sure. So, I love lots of material. So when you go out there and you work for these guys, that's what made, there were two things that made comics popular back in the early eighties. A lot of material, right. They'll keep them there drinking or drink with the crowd. There were guys who drank with the crowd. And so they made the crowd drink more, you know, it cost them their liver, but you know, <laughs> they were popular comics for a while. Yeah. Yeah. There was a, um, I mean, that was the thing that I was always like reading about anyway, when I was younger, before I even started doing stand up, it was like, there was just this, you know, especially like the outlaws of comedy. Like I was friends with Carl above, like when I was young, when I first started doing it, he was really nice to me. And he was the first person to take me to the comedy store. Um, oh, really? When I, yeah. When I got out to LA, I'd contact him and I was like, I'm here, you know, I moved out to LA and he's like, have you been to the comedy store yet? And I was like, no, not yet. And he goes, uh, Alan, Steven and I are going there at midnight. Meet us there. And I was like, uh, Oh, <laughs> what, what was great. that? Remember that was 2015. Wow. wow. Yeah, 2015. Wow. That's great. Uh, Carl's a great guy. 
great. Kid. Yeah, he was a great guy. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so when you went on to Carson for the first time, uh, what was that? Do you remember like, you know, backstage, how you felt and everything? Because that's oh, like man. a very unique experience. It is. I mean, 84, Sam Kennison and I went to New York City to uh, get away from the Olympics because we just knew it was going to be a mess. And right. Macaulay, Jim McCauley saw me do a set at the improv there and said, uh, we're going to put you on the night show in two weeks. Let's figure out a set. Mm. So I started getting nervous at that moment, at that moment, even though you set up, uh, you know, your little five minutes. Right. It, like in, in, it's in, it's on the tablets. It's the, it's like right below the 10 commandments is your five minute set list. Mm -hmm. Just in locked. And, you know, you just practice it night and night and night and night and night and night. And I hope you don't forget it when you walk out there because you have that feeling. I mean, I just watch sure. it. Right. room. Everybody, everybody's, you know, no, you know, everybody's going to be watching. They used to turn the TVs on, you know, here comes the comics are going every night on the tonight show at midnight, the young comics are going at midnight. Right. And everybody knew you were going to be on, you knew everybody be watching. So I was in the dressing room and I was like, um, I was just, you know, looking in the mirror. Trying, I didn't, I'm not used to wearing a tie, you know, I'm not wearing, I used to wear a tie and I'm getting mm -hmm. tired and I'm looking in the mirror and checking this and making right. And one of the guys that was there, uh, uh, one of the other comics, like a guy didn't was he he came with some other people and I don't know him. He goes, he goes, man, you certainly stare in the mirror a lot. And I turned on him, I just ripped his ass for five minutes. But yeah, maybe because there's five million fucking people gonna be watching me, I might want to just go out there and look decent instead of you know, <laughs> and everybody's laughing. And that broke me. That broke me. It was like it was nice. just backstage. And uh that broke me broke me loosened me up a little bit. And um, you know, you you I, I gotta I got a message. Everybody calls you after the show, right? Mm -hmm. But again, I got a message from Jerry Seinfeld on my machine, that message machine back then. And his message was, listen, you've already hit the home run. Don't trip rounding the bases. It doesn't look good for the fans. <laughs> and that's it. It's like, yeah, you've already done all the work. I mean, it's, you know, I've been, right. you know, I, I practiced it. I had it. And um, that was it. You know, it, it goes by so fast. You walk out there, you do it. Boom, you've done it. It's an odd thing. Back then, when you stitch like different jokes from different bits or hunks into like one like odd, yeah. you know, forged five minute piece, you know, mm -hmm. not like you just pull five minutes tape out of your act. They go, oh, I, right. like, I like that when they, they he, you know, he would pick the jokes he liked, and they're like, you had to weld them together with odd little segues, you know. Yeah. So being so being that like, but it's like you like I imagine you're pretty loose when you were going out on the road and stuff like that and, and stuff. When you were doing the Tonight Show back then, and people saw that five minute clip, perfect set you know, clean the whole thing. Was there any kind of weird thing where like people would book you and then because you were different, had different material when you were at the club, they were like, this isn't the guy we saw on the tonight show. Or was it like, yeah. fine. They accepted no, it. no, I was, I was, you know, I would do sexual stuff at the end, but it was really all innuendo. I would say, okay. First of my set, uh, had one time at the end of the show where I'd say Dick, you know, and part of a thing. And that was the last thing. Really. Okay. And all I, I just found I could do sex with all innuendo and it got it got comfortable for me. So no matter where I went now, I had problems with other areas. You know, I I was doing a lot of anti-church material. And so sometimes in the South, I got in a little bit of trouble. I was uh, going to say, but, yeah, that was that's yeah, got to be difficult, yeah. right? Yeah. So it was, it was a content thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I had a whole bit. I had a bunch of different bits. But I had one about Jesus talking to his agent <laughs> because I told us. Sam Kennison, I saw this uh, Striper as a rock and roll band called Striper. They they dressed like black and yellow. I remember going mm -hmm. to see the, the the lead singer came out and he said, you know, Jesus was the first rock and roller. And I went, well, you just put the son of God in the showbiz. So let's see what uh, I'm talking to his agent. Jesus going, you got to get me out of the hills and valleys. I'm dying out there. <laughs> you young kids don't know what they do. You know, you forget. I had you booked in the temple a year ago. An open Messiah night. What do you do? You walk, you kick over the money changers table. I can't get your book back there. So you got to work. You got to build up an act. You know, Moses, 40 years in the desert, building an act, building an act. <laughs> when he comes there, they know who he is. He's got a thing. He got the Ten Commandments. He's got a whole set, a whole thing right there. Locked up here. You got to do something like that. Work on it. Because this water to wine thing, walking on the water, that's fine and good, but you need a closer. You got no closer. All right, nail me to a cross. You got something there. That's the thing you can close. <laughs> so, oh, my God. I, 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 it's funny how I remember that bit. I haven't done it forever. You, you know, that 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 was get, that was getting, people were just, you know, stand up and they would just boo loudly at me. Like, <laughs> you were heretic. It's almost like heretic. You know, I was like. I just love the uh, the visual of Moses forty years building an act. That's such a comic way to look at it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Great. 
oh, wandering the desert, just per- just perfecting it. <laughs> oh, that is fucking hilarious, man. What was your so you were hanging out with Kennison, but like who was your core group? Did you guys have a bunch of people that you went out on the road with? There's a lot of people. I was married to a, a comedian, Carol Lee, from the time. So a lot of times yeah. we got together. I was nice. um, uh, good, good, uh, good, best friends of uh, Kevin Rooney, another comic, um, uh, Ron Zimmerman, who became a writer. Uh, um, Mike McDonald. Ron Zimmerman. Ron Zimmerman. Yeah. Very He's gonna good. kill. Ron, I, I, I've so I feel so bad. I've meant to get him. He's asked to come on the show a few times, and it's always like. Like, you know, the scheduling is always kind of messed up, but I have to get Ron on. I really like the guy. I've never met him before, but he's he seems like a really nice guy. Yeah, he is. And of course, he, he's done a lot in show business. And we he, he, we worked together a lot early on. Uh, Mike McDonald from Canada, who's gone now. But Oh, I know. I like Mike McDonald. Mike from Canada. So I know these guys that you just meet guys, you work with them. There were so many. You, you, you're a headliner. You don't work with other headliners. You know, I know it sucks. Yeah, and it's it's always one of those weird things. That's why I liked uh, you know, the the charity thing that we did where everybody was kind of on at the same time got together and stuff. That was beautiful. That is that those were always fun. Always yeah. fun. Yeah, it was nice. Um when you did the documentary, did you have a hard like did you cuz you said you got the itch to go back on stage. Like you noticed like uh, you know, your producer or whatever noticed that you were like kind of aching to do it. When you were talking to everybody again, did you get a lot of like you know, uh, memories coming back to you all of a sudden, like emotional things stepping back into the clubs and stuff and doing it. Yeah, I, I, I it was almost it was as as if I, in some ways, I'd done it before and it, muscle memory came back. Mm-hmm. But at first, I was so conflicted. Like I didn't. I remember one time I came off. I did a set somewhere in West Hollywood. You know, young, a lot of young comics on the thing, and I go up there and I try to do virtually like fifteen minutes of all new material. Yeah. And, and Jason Sklar, the Sklar brothers, comes over to me because you know you are legally allowed to do old material. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 I got you now. I mean, I just, I was, it was, there was a lot of stuff. So you're, you know, it was coming back with um that I had this history, but I didn't feel like I wanted to touch it. Sure. Um, again, and uh, but on the other hand, you really can't. I couldn't change my style. I mean, most no. people. That's what Carlin and Richard. I mean, you, you you don't change your style of comedy, even to change your material, how you look at things or how you, you know, like he went from, a, you know, the hippie thing to the observational comedy to the angry sage or Richard Pryor changing the way he approached the audience completely. Yes. I mean, that's unusual. I mean, I, I, so I, I had this weird thing of like, it wasn't like I was going to perform like Gilbert all of a sudden or perform like, <laughs> you know, like Emo Phillips. I was going to do one liners. I mean, there's only one way I was going to do it. But I, I just felt, um, I don't know what, I guess it was all the old material was not not usable. I don't know what. No, I mean, I don't blame you for trying to go into new stuff, too. I mean, that's just, na- I think that's just natural for a comic, especially if you've been gone, you know, for yeah. a little bit. You're like, what am I going to do? You know, you got to test the waters. Um, do you remember the decision you made when you when you stopped? Do, do you remember why you stopped doing it? It wasn't an actual decision. It seemed to happen. I, you know, I, I had kids and I was, um, uh, I'd run out of um, uh, deals. I had five pilots that failed. So it wasn't going to get any more network deals. And I went out on the road. I got heckled by Sean Penn. What? And this is a short version of the story. Yeah, I was down in South Carolina, and this guy heckling me. And it was like one of those beautiful moments where he was great heckler. We had fun exchanges going wow. back. I didn't know who it was. Just getting huge laughs, both of us. Mm-hmm. And then I popped out, and I'd do a hunk of material. And then I'd go over. It's like a rhythm. i go get a glass of water or the piano and look at him out in the dark. And then he'd come back, and here we go. Again. So I hung out with him all night, like 4 or 5 in the morning. And I said, I got to go back to the hotel room, man. I'm not partying. I'm not doing any, anything. I'm not drinking. I'm not doing drugs. And right. I said, I'm back, man. I'm done. He said, hey, before you go, I got to tell you something. Now, I think he's going to say, this is this is like 1993 or something. He said, I think he's going to say, you know, you got to do a movie with me. We have to do a movie together. We got to do something, man, because we got right. a thing here, man. We got a comedy thing here. Right. And he says, you got to move to L.A. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 for 10 years i've been in la for 10 years i thought he knew who i was i thought he, knew. he just thought he found a funny guy in south carolina he didn't know who i was then oh i my went God. back to my hotel room i go i haven't made a dent man i'm not getting anywhere fuck and so um a friend of mine says look everybody likes your writing try to write for a sitcom so i just called everybody who i knew who had a sitcom at the time tim allen and roseanne and jerry seinfeld i just left messages for people nice and, and Roseanne called me back and said, show up to work tomorrow. You got a job. And that's where I started writing. So by 97, 98, I've been writing for TV for a while. And I had not been doing much stand-up. And I just noticed I wasn't doing stand-up anymore. You know, right. the thing about having kids is 
you know, you don't go out and hang out the club every night, you know, sure. Got to be home, read them a story, go to bed. You know, that, I'd get up and work the next day at the, at, at writing. So I wasn't doing stand up anymore. I just noticed I'd stopped by around 97, 98. Wow. That's, I mean, that, I, that's probably, if you're going to, if you're going to stop doing it, at least it was a gradual thing and it wasn't like, you know, the gradual when, talks did not help. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, you, you had like a good writing job, you know, it wasn't just like, it was like, you yeah. know, you were writing job. Does it, it pays the bills. It does not feed the soul, man. Oh, it did, wow. It laughter. I missed the laughter, the laughter, you know, it calibrated me. It let me mm. know I was okay in the world. It helped sob those old wounds that never go away and you know right. what i'm talking about and yeah absolutely and and when i missed it i went depression I mean, now all of a sudden i find myself i'm going to see psychiatrists i'm going to, uh, all the things i had never done and i'm not talking about i, I hadn't been drinking for 10 years at this point you know right nothing to do with that i just went into a funk that i didn't come out of until i got back on stage wow that's be yeah i mean i know what you mean man it sucks when he, when you're gone from it for a while like I would have friends who would be like, you were really fucking cranky. When is the last time you went on stage? <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, you know, you may, you got a point. I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably yeah. go do some stand up. Yeah. I mean, if you're really a comic, I mean, it, it's the laughter that did everything. The laughter was my music, my drug. And I tried every drug there is. And there's nothing like that pure, uncut approval. That's what laughter is. Yep. It's pure, uncut approval. Yeah. You know, no filter to it. No, no fakeness to it. It's genuine, honest approval. And there was nothing like that. And I know it's, you know, like I'm damaged goods. <laughs> <That's> just, <laughs> you know, I mean, there, to me, I, I had this thing of there are two types of people to go in to do comedy because it's such an odd job, right? Mm -hmm. And we all know people who are funny that didn't ever come into comedy, that never wanted to go on stage. I had guys I grew up with funny as me, funnier, never right. took Mike. But I was—I think you're either one of two things. You either treated like the prince of the family, everything you do is great and honored, mm -hmm. and you get approval all the time, or you're treated like the POW, you're beaten like a dog, physically or emotionally. So the prince is going to get uh, when you get out of school, right? You're not going to go get that kind of approval that you got as a kid in a cubicle, man. You're not going sure. to get it even yeah. on the get that stuff. You got to get on stage. They're going to get what they feel entitled to, what they deserve. That approval and love that they got and the POWs up there to get what they never did get, you know? Wow. So the, so the, the prince is out there like riding a bike, no hands. Look, mom, no hands. On stage, yeah. Yeah. Joyful celebration of the performance. And the POW is like, can you see me now? Can you see me? <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard it described that way. And I think that's the best way I've ever heard. That's a good point. Yeah, so I mean, I, I I can usually watch and tell who the person is by the way they take applause. I can usually see if they're a prince or POW, princess, whatever you want to say, prince, prince, yeah. they, them, whatever yeah, it is, yeah. by by the way, applause <laughs> because the prince will step there until they get that standing ovation. They they you can't give them enough. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I, like wash over me, and the POW gets that mic in the stand is off the stage before they change their mind. You know, it's like I don't. <laughs> 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 right. right. Absolutely. Doesn't hang around in the green room. Doesn't want to take pictures <laughs> afterward. They're gone. <laughs> no, look, go on to the next fix. Yeah. Um, I got, thank you, dude. I've, I've been loving doing this. The time fucking flew by like unbelievably fast. Um, I just have two more questions for you and I hope you can stick around to ask them. Um, one of them is if you can go back in time and talk to your younger self and give yourself a piece of advice that would help you today, what would it be? I don't think I could tell my younger self anything. I was like a, uh, I was like amoeba, just reacting to heat and light. I don't know if I, could, <laughs> I could really like. I think I would tell my younger self, you know, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Just keep yeah. going. It's going to be, just keep your head up. It's going to be all right. That's what I tell them. You know, you. keep your head up, going the way you're going. It's going to be all right. I came to be all right. It nice. took, you know, two marriages. It took me. It took me time. It took me time. I'm, I wasn't a fast learner. I wasn't a guy that got healed. And, you know, I mean, I, I lived with that um, self-hatred and anger for a long time. So it, just to give yourself time. I think that there's a great line that um, Tony Bennett had in the Amy Winehouse documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, I love it. He, says, he was talking about her. He said, you know, life will teach you how to live if you can live long enough. Wow. That's a great line. I've never seen I'm going to have to check out the documentary. I saw the new one that he just did with uh, Lady Gaga, which is beautiful. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, and the other question is, 
what in your life had to end in order for you to wind up where you are now? Good or bad, it could be. Or and it doesn't have to be necessarily career-wise either. Well, very clearly, I had to quit drinking and doing drugs. That right. clearly in 1985, or I wouldn't be talking to you now. Right. And my trajectory was not to live at that, you know, I didn't, and I didn't didn't take anybody else out or hurt anybody else out. I was in a lot of drunk driving accidents and my fault. Never hurt anybody else. Broke a few of my bones. That's it. Broke, mm -hmm. you know. But that had to, that was the biggest thing that started to change for me. Uh, to to where like these years later, I I I you know I sleep well and uh, and and I, I and and I'm pretty good to the people around me. And that's that's the most important thing. You know? Awesome. Dude, well, thank you so much. It's nice to virtually meet you. I hope to get to meet you in person one day. Maybe we can do a gig together or something. I can't tell you how much fun I had. You guys were great. And I really thank you. Guys. Thank you so much. It was a great, great show. Thank you. For, thank you. Thank you so much, man. You're phenomenal. It was an it's honor to have you. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Absolutely. It's You're going to so have to come knowledge. back. Anytime. Anytime. Thank you. Take care, Absolutely. man. Absolutely. Such a pleasure. Thanks again, Ryan. Dystopia tonight.